involved in promoting principled engagement uh, between the United States uh, and North Korea. Uh, this is a fascinating time in Northeast Asia. Uh, we have the Russia invasion of Ukraine. We have uh, a cutoff, a cutoff of discussions of communications between North Korea and the United States. We also have an escalation of tensions on the Korean Peninsula, uh, contributed to by both sides. And so uh, we are in a fascinating time, and NCNK is privileged today to bring to you three, not just top experts based in Europe, but three of the top global experts on North Korea. And we have with us Rudiger Frank, Professor of East Asian Ec Ec Economy and Society at the University of Vienna, Rachel Min Young Lee, Regional Issues Manager and Senior Analyst at the Open Nuclear Network, and a non-resident fellow at the Stimson Center's 38th program. And we have Glenn Ford, over 25 years, a member of the European Parliament. He's an author, a, a facilitator of track two talks uh, with North Korea. Now there is a lot more about each of these individuals which you can find uh, in their bios, uh, which you have received as part of the announcement. But uh, we're going to begin now uh, with Rudiger Frank uh, to give his assessment of the situation. Rüdiger? Thank you, Keith, and uh, thanks for the invitation and for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you. Um, I've been given two tasks. One is to start us off with more of a macro analysis of the current situation, and then to add a few remarks on the current status of North Korea's economy and on future challenges for us as analysts, North Korea watchers, policymakers, or however you would like to categorize yourself. So let me just begin with the big picture, which in itself, I suppose, is a potential point for a discussion. We find ourselves at a critical juncture right now. I'm talking about the qualitative change of the situation, not just some incremental or quantitative changes. Um, this critical juncture is the re-emergence of a bipolar world with two antagonistic blocks. These blocks fight each other economically, politically, and uh, that's important also ideologically. Occasionally, they might even fight each other militarily, for example, by leading proxy wars. The uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine last year has certainly accentuated this development, uh, which has been in the making for quite a while, actually. I called this Cold War 2.0 already 10 years ago, and currently it seems the term new Cold War seems to dominate, uh, who knows on what we will settle in, in the end. Um, the thing is that most countries, whether they like it or not, and that's, uh, that's of course the problem here, will eventually have to decide which side to, to join, um, that, which in many cases means to choose between two pretty bad options actually. We as Europeans uh, do not really have much of a choice, but we are many. And we can at least delay a final decision. We're very good at delaying things, actually. Um, South Korea uh, is going to suffer a lot more as a result and might serve even as a test case for us in Europe on uh, what is coming. And North Korea, which, of course, we are going to talk about today mainly, is, as I would say, one of the very few countries that stand to benefit from this new situation. So why do I believe that this is all good for North Korea? Well, if you look back at the past uh, three decades, North Korea has been more or less alone since around 1990 when the socialist bloc imploded. Um, neither Moscow nor Beijing had anything to gain anymore from supporting Pyongyang, and they didn't want to jeopardize their newly acquired good relations with Washington. North Korea, and that is also important because it's different now, had no means to keep its two allies engaged against their will. So as a result, North Korea, as we all know pretty well, went through a series of economic crises, some of which were actually quite existential. Um, collapse has been predicted a couple of times. It didn't come, partly because North Korea's leadership took many risks to survive, including some half-hearted economic reforms, cooperation with its enemies, including South Korea, or the economically and politically very costly development of nuclear weapons. Amongst these costs were, again, as we are all very much aware of, uh, were isolation and uh, comprehensive sanctions. 
these uh, sanctions effectively prevented the import of oil, the export of labor and minerals, and also participation in the international financial system. Trade right now, if you look at the figures from Chinese customs or from COTRA, is where it was somewhere in the mid-1990s, which is very low. Economic growth is in the lower one-digit range, if not even negative, depending on what kind of data you want to use. And the food issue has not been resolved despite repeated efforts by the leadership. Meanwhile, the gap between North Korea and its main strategic opponents, such as South Korea and also China, is widening, and the information monopoly of the state erodes. Now, as I would argue, the fundamental change we witness right now is that much of this is interestingly not going to be of a, much of a major concern anymore for the leadership in Pyongyang. And that's the key thing that has been happening in the last years and in particular in the last year. Um, it's now very unlikely that the UN Security Council, for example, will pass any new resolution against North Korea. Russia and or China will definitely veto it. And in fact, I think it's only a matter of time before existing sanctions will de facto become irrelevant. Some of you might argue that this is already happening, but I think there is more to come in this direction. Although actually both China and Russia so far deny that, but uh, well, we, we, will, we will see. Um, it's also not very likely that the US or its allies will intervene militarily in North Korea. Remember, under Bill Clinton, they discussed some surgical strike. I think this is now not an option anymore, of course, due to North Korea's nuclear deterrent, but also uh, because China and Russia are now much less likely than, say, 10 or 20 years ago to remain passive in the wake of such an intervention. It's also unlikely that a new major famine will happen in North Korea because China or Russia are now much better motivated to make up for the shortfall, which of course they can do relatively easily. Um, so North Korea's leaders or leader feels more secure militarily, uh, better supported in terms of foreign policy and uh, less under pressure economically although the fundamentals haven't really changed. But the geopolitical situation is the thing that really matters. Um, this is a comfortable situation for the leadership in Pyongyang. And of course, it will have consequences. For example, uh, it will not be necessary anymore for the North Koreans to let in Western tourists. Chinese tourists, maybe, but not Westerners. I should say that in the interest of my friends in that business, I sincerely hope that I'm wrong on that point, but again, we will see. Um, North Korea can also expect uh, imports of oil and gas, of advanced civilian and even military technologies. Um, it can hope for foreign direct investment, finally, in its about uh, 30 special economic zones, participation in non-Western international systems of payment. You know that these are being built up at a particularly high speed right now. It can hope for access to loans, friendship prices, and aid, like basically in the good old days of the first Cold War, just with much more potent and modern partners um, and with much more maneuvering space within that alliance. In fact, if Pyongyang really has China and Russia as economic partners, it will actually hardly need anyone else anymore which significantly limits the uh, options that we in the West have in terms of exerting pressure on North Korea or offering them something. Um, North Korea can hope to generate revenue more than ever by exporting labor, mineral products, and perhaps even military supplies. We heard rumors, but um, well, we still need to see proof, but the potential is clearly there. And if we consider the positive impact of the Korean War for Japan's economic development in the 1950s and of the Vietnam War for South Korea's economic development in the 1960s and 70s, then who knows what the war in Ukraine or whatever comes next uh, will do for the North Korean economy. The uh, oil refinery in Rasson that has been idle for a long time might be reactivated. The uh, chemical factory in Hungnam might finally be modernized. And even the old dream, remember, agreed framework uh, of having a functioning nuclear power station or two might eventually come true, solving the most pressing energy issue that is the root cause of so many other follow-up problems of North Korea's economy.
And uh, with Chinese help, even decentralized solutions for power generation um, can actually be implemented on a massive scale in North Korea. So what does all that mean for how we deal with North Korea in the future? Um, in general terms, I'd say North Korea will be under much less economic pressure to negotiate with the West. That seems like bad news, but let's face it, even when this pressure was actually quite strong, it didn't really lead to much, right? Um, and there's a silver lining on the horizon. If you look back at the first Cold War, then we realize that North Korea might still have an interest in talking to the West, if only to increase pressure on its allies to be more generous. Think back to 2018, when uh, Xi Jinping's interest in Kim Jong-un suddenly grew as soon as Kim Jong-un was about to start talking to Presidents Moon and Trump, for example. Um, the only country that North Korea cares about is North Korea. So if Washington plays its cards well, it could even initiate something that I would call a second Nixon shock or something. The North Koreans would have no problem at all, um, you know, starting um, a dialogue if they find it useful for themselves. And the fact that we saw many missile tests in the past months, years, but so far no seventh nuclear test uh, so far is an interesting development that I think we might need to interpret through the lens of this new situation. Even for economic reforms, I think there is still room for progress, although that's a pretty long shot, I would agree. But it all depends on how on, on why you think North Korea's leadership would decide to follow, let's say, the Chinese or the Vietnamese way. Desperation is, of course, one option, right? And this is what has been at work since the 1990s, but this is obviously over now. But another possible enabling factor for economic reforms, market-oriented reforms, would actually be quite the opposite. The feeling of being safe and secure, which is something that hardly existed, even in the early 2000s, but it might be coming now. So it's a new situation, and uh, who knows, maybe this will lead to unexpected, even positive results. Um, so far, we have no indicator that any of this is happening, and I know Rachel is going to talk more about um, kind of the domestic signals that North Korea is sending, but the transition to the Cold War that I just mentioned is still ongoing, and the geopolitical situation has, has not yet stabilized on a new level, so I guess patience might be advisable. Um, to conclude, let me emphasize this key point uh, just once again. We are in the middle of something that is huge, but so far incomplete. Whether your main concern is human rights or the nuclear issue or economic reforms or inter-Korean relations, many concepts and methods that we have developed and applied in the past two or three decades might have become irrelevant, but at the same time, new ones are emerging and we are only beginning to understand what all that means uh, in more detail. Therefore, um, now more than ever, I think we need to be open-minded and flexible in our approaches and we need to be ready to go back to the drawing board if this is necessary. Uh, on a side note, to facilitate such a debate, uh, the European Center for North Korean Studies has been founded here in Vienna. If you're interested in what we do, uh, check it out at ecnk.eu, and the link is also in my CV. Um, but now, I hope I kept it kind of below 10 minutes as agreed. I look forward to remarks by my distinguished colleagues and, of course, also to a critical discussion with all you experts out there. Thank you. Rudiger, thank you. And to the audience, I would say that uh, if you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A function. Rachel, what's your take on what Rudiger just shared with us? Uh, Keith, I think uh, Rudiger's, uh, Rudiger raised a lot of really valid points uh, in terms of what we are witnessing um, in terms of North Korea's behavior, uh, the unprecedented, no, unprecedented number of missile launches we saw in 2022, um, just the unusual level of tit-for-tat responses that we saw from North Korea in the fall of uh, uh, 2022. So basically the question is why North Korea is acting the way it does, right? And um, the international environment, Rudiger, you mentioned um, how the current environment provides more maneuvering space uh, for North Korea, 
um, which in a way makes it harder for um, nuclear negotiations going forward, but perhaps forcing us to think about more creative ways uh, to engage North Korea. And um, you also, one of the things that really resonated with me is that what we're seeing now is an ongoing thing and that what we may be seeing is a more, maybe a fundamental uh, strategic um, shift in North Korea's policy. And uh, that is something that I've also um, been following and grappling with. And one thing that I have sort of focused on for the last few months is the question of whether in Pyongyang's top leadership's mind, China and to a lesser extent, Russia uh, have replaced the US in terms of North Korea's um, strategic calculations. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Rudiger, in your presentation uh, that North Korea now feels more safe and secure because of the international um, environment. So whether this would be, uh, whether this is not actually a good motivator for Pyongyang to go ahead with its reform um, and, and so forth. Uh, so um, maybe we can talk about that a little bit more. So in terms of North Korea's strategic calculations, where does the US fall? Because we definitely have seen North Korea realigning itself with the Chinese and, um, and the Russians. And we have also heard Kim Jong-un talking about denuclearization in his speech to the Supreme People's Assembly in September 2022, in terms that we had never heard him talk about, um, say, in public before. Um, and it would also be interesting to uh, hear Glenn's um, comments, um, too, of course, on this question. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Glenn, your response to Rudiger's uh, opening statement? Well, I mean, I I largely agree with all that's been said previously. I mean, the new Cold War and the Ukraine invasion means a major seismic shift in geopolitics. Uh, that's fairly obvious. North Korea no longer needs to fear to, to be driven to collapse and regime change. In the last resort, both Russia and China will, will support politically the, the North and the Chinese will support it economically. But frankly, the 24 million people in North Korea, the, the cost of keeping them alive and reasonably happy is small change in, 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 uh, in terms of what China, China's actually spending. So in the last resort, China's there. Uh, they're not entire, China, Beijing's not entirely happen, happy with what's going on in, uh, uh, in North Korea. And the issue of, the, uh, of a new nuclear test will be, will be one of those areas. But China's experience of what actually happened following the uh, the collapse of the Russian Empire uh, suggests to them that it's very important that they they prop up North Korea. Uh, they have absolutely no trust that following the promises that were made verbally uh, that if you want Central and Eastern Europe would not be incorporated into the European Union and certainly not incorporated into NATO would be true of an assimilated uh, North Korea in the South. Uh, they see U.S. troops sort of patrolling the banks of the Yellow River. And so that means that they will pay a lot of resources to keep, uh, to keep uh, Pyongyang a a alive and in existence. Uh, I, the one area I do disagree with Rudiger on is the, the idea that the nuclear weapons program is expensive. I think the nuclear weapons program is the cheap option. And uh, it's the cheap option that was taken because of, the, if you want, North Korea's position of weakness, not strength. Uh, I mean, the, the 2021 increase in the military budget in the Republic of Korea was equivalent to between 50 and 100 percent of North Korea's total military spending. They are being outspent by the South by a factor of getting something close to 20. Uh, so they have no option apart from to find it's the it's the magic. Well, magic bullet in a sense to actually actually defend and it also helps to deal with two other problems uh, the two big shortages in north korea are actually manpower it literally is manpower because there are a million men in the army and energy the nuclear option actually enables you to, firstly to decamp people out of the army a uh, hundred thousand men into industry would be very would be very useful allowing for the shortages and secondly, energy. 
I mean, one of the big problems with the six party talks, one of the big problems, frankly, with the Biden administration is this refusal to recognize the ability for North Korea to have its own civil nuclear program, because that will help solve the, the energy sh shortages, which are, are, are very important. Now, in a sense, uh, it's, it's a very old fashioned model, but I mean, the, the idea of having thousands of people working in big factories, but North Korea is probably the last bastion of skilled cheap labor. There's lots of unskilled cheap labor, but North Korea, you've got skilled cheap labor, which is extremely valuable. Uh, there's an argument about who's going to do the talking. Uh, and I've mentioned this before in previous ventures with NCNK. But the North Koreans are willing to talk. It's, uh, they don't want to talk to the US at the moment. They don't want to talk to South Korea and certainly not to Japan. But they have made at least three attempts, to my knowledge, over the last couple of years to try and engage with the European Union, for example. And uh, they, they formally asked to restart the political dialogue with the EU. And it was the EU that refused. Now, we could go into all of that. It's mainly driven by Paris and, to a certain extent, Berlin. I think Brussels would, would be willing to engage, but the member states are, are, are the biggest problem. But it does open that dialogue. Uh, they're rather unhappy with Sweden at the moment, with the membership of NATO. Uh, there's certainly some interest that's very uh, in maybe using Austria, which is not yet a NATO member, as actually a, 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 as actually a, pla as, as a platform. On the long-term goal of... It, denuclearization. I think you can have a, a, a conversation. Uh, I don't see any early gains uh, in terms of serious denuclearization, but there can be arms control talks. And you certainly have the situation in the period 2011, after Kim Jong-un came to power, 2018, where the North was looking for a Nixon moment. The North was constantly trying to encourage uh, the United States, and it was only when it was clear that that was not on offer that they actually turned to Xi Jinping, and you you have that rapprochement, but certainly for a period there, the, the Chinese were almost begging the North Koreans to engage with them, and the North Koreans were saying no. So we may get somewhere. I think sanctions are dead, uh, apart from politically. They're uh, economically, I mean, there's, it, it, it's over. Uh, I really don't see uh, sanctions being a barrier to the North Koreans in, in, in any meaningful way. And I certainly think Ruder has got some very valuable points about how we, we need to look at what this is going to do for the economy in, in the longer term. Certainly, if they've got the energy, if they've got the manpower, and you've got a, a, a kind of semi-war economy or, or a, a surrogate war economy, the North could benefit enormously from uh, what's actually happening in, in Ukraine and elsewhere if that continues. Glenn, thank you. Uh, Rudiger, before we turn to Rachel to get her assessment of the internal situation, Rudiger, uh, would you like to uh, reply to, to Rachel or to Glenn? Any of their remarks? Well, just very briefly, because I don't want to keep everyone up. Uh, the one point that I find important, um, and I know there are some scholars of the first Cold War here in the audience, um, I think this uh, knowledge that we acquired about what happened in the 50s, 60s, and 70s uh, might actually become quite relevant in the future. Um, and that is based on the understanding that the alliance, North Korea, Russia, China, it's of course not a, not a happy thing, you know. Uh, there is lots of conflict in there. And um, the, North Korea has, during the first Cold War, already been a very, very problematic ally. I don't think this is really going to change on the contrary because they now have nuclear weapons and even more self-confidence um and i do believe that this is where we have scope for talks i mean one needs to be realistic in terms of what can come out of those talks but i'm pretty sure that washington will be happy just you know um making china a little nervous um so for that very sake i think the north koreans would be more than happy to meet, especially if there's something in there for them. Also to keep, you know, their good friends and allies uh, at a safe distance away and keep themselves interesting in their eyes, you know. So this is where I actually see potential for totally different reasons compared to 10 years ago. But it's not like everything's over. It will just be built on a different uh, foundation. So 
Rudiger, I, I really appreciate your perspective on history and, and injecting that topic uh, into this discussion. Often in the United States, we view the situation uh, regarding North Korea as a bilateral issue, bilateral confrontation, et cetera. And uh, as you know, uh, when Kim Jong-un took over, he spent quite a bit of time researching his grandfather's, Kim Il-sung's relationship with Stalin. Uh, Kim Jong-un spent a lot of time trying to get a handle on his father and grandfather's uh, interactions with other parts of Northeast Asia. And it's not lost on the North Koreans that, you know, Chinese incursions onto the peninsula go back to what, 300 BC or so, the Mongol invasions, the Japanese occupation, the Korean War, et cetera. And so in, in the mind of Kim Jong-un, uh, he lives in a rough neighborhood that he, with which he has to deal or leverage from time to time, never mind his issues with the South and with the U.S. So thank you for bringing that in, into the discussion because history, its application of history and lessons of history will very much be on Kim Jong-un's mind um, as he plans ahead. But Rudiger, one point of clarification, please, that, that may be helpful here. Um, we know that China is a major source of assistance for North Korea, and all three of you have talked about this to some degree. But Rudiger, early on, you mentioned China as a strategic opponent, I believe, if I heard you correctly, of North Korea. Can you please elaborate on that? Well, I mean, it's part what you mentioned. Um, the uh, historical relationship hasn't been a very easy one. And even without knowing a thing about history, I mean, you look at the map and you realize who is the biggest threat for a small country like North Korea. Um, an aspect that we have not mentioned yet is, of course, the ideological threat or ideological challenge, because uh, even though North Korea is quite still quite isolated in terms of the flow of information uh, with the rest of the world, they are pretty well connected to China through numerous people to people exchanges. Also, the bar is a little lower for information to enter North Korea from China. And um, I mean, if you look at China, it's definitely a, a hyper modern society where despite all these step setbacks that we are experiencing right now, still much more of an open and pluralistic society compared to North Korea. At the same time, it claims to be socialist and it's still a one party system. So I think it's an ideological threat to North Korea. And from that perspective as well, I think it's a it's a huge challenge for the North Korean system. So I think this strategic uh, challenge uh, really encompasses a number of things, a military threat, an economic threat, because China can still suffocate the North Koreans, but also the ideological threat. All right, thank you. Um, Rachel, talk to us, if you would, please about the domestic situation within North Korea, as you have observed uh, North Korean media? Uh, so I think uh, all of us uh, gathered here today are more or less in search of answers to two questions. Why is North Korea do doing what it's doing? And number two, where is it headed? Uh, only when we know the answers to these um, questions can we figure out the opportunities and challenges regarding North Korea, uh, as the title of the program also says. Um, and answering these questions requires a review of the domestic and external uh, factors that drive uh, North Korea's calculations. Um, so domestically, North Korea has been challenged by the failed U.S.-North Korea summit in Hanoi and deteriorating economic conditions resulting from international sanctions and the ongoing border lockdown that it first instituted in January 2020 to prevent a COVID outbreak. But as always, North Korea has managed to turn these challenges into an opportunity. Uh, a confluence of these three milestones, the failed US, uh, U US North Korea summit in Hanoi, a lack of prospects for a break that breakthrough in relations with the US in the near future and the ongoing border lockdown uh, resulted in a conservative uh, policies regaining a foothold in North Korea across all realms of society um, and even in the foreign policy um, realm. And this enabled Pyongyang to make a uh, course correction across a number of areas where it felt too much freedom had been given 
Uh, in recent years, we have all heard much about North Korea's tight control or tighter control across all realms of society. Examples include clampdown on the distribution and consumption of foreign cultural content and about North Korea exerting greater central control in, uh, in the economy. And which of course goes against Kim Jong-un's economic reform initiatives whose central component was to give greater uh, management rights to individual economic units and even workers. So one area that carries particular significance for North Korea's longer term strategic calculations is its intent toward economic reform. Uh, the near term significance uh, is that there has been a strong correlation between North Korea's uh, intent to improve the economy through reform and its posture on diplomatic engagement, uh, particularly with the US. And this is because Pyongyang has traditionally viewed improved relations with the US as being crucial for the success of its economic reform. The longer term uh, uh, significance uh, is that improving relations with the US may no longer be important for Pyongyang. If Pyongyang is no longer interested in economic reform at all, or if it remains interested in some form of economic reform, but just not in the way that Kim Jong-un had originally envisioned. Or if North Korea somehow thinks that it can make some progress on reform with Chinese help. Um, and this is something that Rudiger also earlier mentioned in his presentation. Uh, there have been media reports uh, recently about North Korea's attempt to attract Chinese investment, which I think um, is something that we need to keep in mind. Externally, on the surface, it may appear that the complexities of today's geopolitics are more of an opportunity than a challenge for North Korea. It goes without saying that the obvious benefit of the widening and deepening rift between the U.S. and China and the U.S. and Russia are the political cover that North Korea receives in the U.N. Security Council. We should also take note of the multiple media reports on North Korea's financial benefits from its strong ties to Russia, for example, its alleged exports of rockets and shells to Russia. Digging deeper, I think we find that North Korea's foreign policy appears to be undergoing a fundamental change, one that signals a reversal of its three-decade policy of normalization of relations with the U.S. through denuclearization, and also a reversal of its three-decade policy of non-alignment with China and Russia. So in a speech in September 2022, uh, Kim Jong-un said a line of no retreat had been drawn and that there would be no longer any bargaining over the country's nuclear weapons. And again, these words were his strongest in public on the subject um, before he went so far as to say that North Korea would not denuclearize un unless the U.S. withdraws its hostile policy. But these comments about no longer any bargaining line of no retreat had been drawn were much stronger than his previous comments. Um, and again, this comment um, in September 2022 appeared to signal uh, a reversal of Pyongyang's three-decade policy toward the U.S. Uh, on the other hand, North Korea steadily pivoted toward China since the failure of the Hanoi summit. North Korea's pivot toward China uh, toward Russia is recent, but it's been more dramatic. Uh, North Korea voiced implicit support for Russia in the wake of its invasion of Ukraine. Kim's letter to Putin in June 2022 and again um, in August 2022 mentioned strategic and tactical cooperation between the two countries. Uh, and this was very notable in the sense that this expression, strategic and tactical cooperation, uh, traditionally had been reserved for China. And one has to wonder in the current context what Pyongyang could mean by strategic and tactical cooperation uh, with the Russians. So if this change in Pyongyang's foreign policy is indeed a fundamental change for the longer term, rather than a tactical change for the near to the medium term, and by change, I mean one where China and to the to less, lesser extent Russia um, is the alternative to the US um, for, for Pyongyang, where does this leave us? <clears throat> and the prospects for nuclear diplomacy. And uh, I will end my comments here and then look forward to our discussion. Thank you. So Glenn, in a moment, I'll give you an opportunity to um, follow up with Rachel, any question you might have. Um, but, but first, Rachel, when we talk about North Korea, we talk about North Korea state media, we talk about uh, 
North Korean population viewership mm -hmm. of the media. What does that mean? To what degree are the North Korean citizens uh, outside of Pyongyang, to what degree are they aware of the outside world? To what degree do they have a sense of, of really what's, what's occurring? Uh, not much beyond what they uh, hear <clears throat> through state media. And of course, they have their um, informal um, means of communication, like um, their uh, third broadcasting network, um, the posters on the streets that don't make it um, to state media. But I would say those are the two main means, um, the state media and um, the informal um, means of communication. And also, there may be some information they um, pick up from friends outside of the country. But I think that's becoming harder and harder with the clampdown and information. So is the state media providing more coverage of events outside of the peninsula or not? Um, that's a very good question. So in October 2019, uh, about five months, a few months after the Hanoi summit um, failed, um, the party daily stopped running commentaries on foreign policy, on foreign, foreign affairs, international affairs, which was a um, drastic change from the past because every day you would see at least one commentary. Um, but recently, they have not resumed um, carrying commentaries um, in, uh, domestically, but they have started carrying more, uh, more content um, about South Korea, the U.S., for example, the Washington Declaration. They have run series on that, um, you know, Yoon's visit to the U.S. Um, there has been more language about NATO, about AUKUS. Uh, more coverage about Chinese uh, foreign ministry's position on these issues, as well as the Russian um, position on these issues. And that's been a fairly uh, recent development, I would say, starting in um, in mid-March. Mid All right. Thank you. Glenn, any question for Rachel? Well, oh, yeah, some, some comments. I mean, North Korea is a country where internal movement has always been extremely limited. You have to get permission to, to move around, certainly to, to travel to Pyongyang. Uh, with the lockdown, that's even worse. So I think the level of knowledge uh, outside of Pyongyang, at least, of uh, what's happening in the world is extremely limited. The only exception to that might be the border areas with China, where uh, there's some leakage. You know, mobile phones can be used in, in North Korea if you're close to, if you're close to the Chinese stations and the rest. But if you're if you're anywhere south of the immediate border areas, I think uh, outside of Pyongyang, you, you you know nothing that the the, the party is not telling you. Um, so I mean that's one of the problem areas. Uh, in terms of the economy, uh, it seems to me that there are two elements to the economic reforms. One was if you want to release uh, if you want the state industries, and I think the model increasingly was if if you want. Uh, you know, st state st state owned enterprises were allowed to innovate, and you, Air Corio runs taxis and sells uh, and, and sells soft drinks. You're you're getting that kind of vertical uh, integration, and at the, at the same time, you also have what I call the Ronin capitalists, who are the people selling things on the streets. And I think if you want the the state owned enterprises are continuing to to uh, to reform. But uh, there has been a very sharp clampdown on 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 those Ronin on those Ronin capitalists because they were they were not under control, uh, and I think that's likely uh, that's likely to continue. So those are my my two main comments. But apart from that, I think I, I I agree with the general tone of the discussion. Thank you, Rudiger. Your reflection on uh, Rachel's remarks. Yeah, just uh, one detail. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was actually sent a KCNA article from the uh, North Korean embassy here in Vienna. But again, it was a normal article. They just found it important enough to email it uh, to me and I guess a few other people. And that was about Africa. I found that quite remarkable. About um, It was a combination of a criticism of US and Western policies in Africa, but also a criticism of the West's criticism of what China is doing in Africa. So, uh, of course, we know that North Korea has for a long time had this South-South cooperation um, 
uh, as one of its topics um, and uh, even longer before they had tried to export juche to Africa, etc. Um, but I found that remarkable because um, it, it has been one of these rare cases where they have shown a clear interest uh, beyond not just North Korea, but even beyond East Asia. And that was not like your usual superficial KCNA article. It was one authored by a specific researcher and uh, included a fair amount of detail. So I found that remarkable, whatever that means. But it seems that the North Koreans set their mind more on, you know, internationalization. And Africa seems to be one of these areas. And also a very strong support of China. I think that's part of the deal, uh, of course, as being part of this alliance, again, that they more strongly support the Chinese position. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be careful with not exaggerating the North Korean-Russian link. Uh, ideologically, I think it's important. But I think economically, the, the flow, uh, I mean, China is, is 10, 20, 30 times more important to North Korea economically than, than Russia ever will be. Uh, Russia's 2% of the global economy, China's 20% and next door. I mean, uh, frankly, people are monitoring uh, the single track railway line that cross, crosses from North Korea to Russia. And, and they're talking about six carriages. The idea that the, 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 the North Koreans are shipping vast quantities of arms seems to me it, it, not, not possible. I mean, I'm sure they're quite happy to do it, but let, let's get it in context. Uh, the, the big economic player is China. Russia is, is a bit part player at best. Glenn, so, can, I ask you, can I ask you something, Glenn? Um, then why is it that North Korea is pivoting to Russia the way it has been for the last one year? Why do you think that is? Is it just because of the extra political cover in the UN well, um, Security Council in case China goes rogue? Yeah, I mean, they always pay a lot of attention to Security Council countries. Uh, the one thing I didn't mention is the UK. The UK has talked about opening a political dialogue with North Korea uh, when things are back in balance, i.e. When, when the UK embassy is reopened in Pyongyang uh, uh, to parallel the, the DPRK, the North Korean embassy in London. Uh, so they pay attention to them. I mean, there's obviously good reasons. And yes, they quite like Russia to be more uh, to be more generous. But this is not a time that Russia can afford to be very generous. So, uh, you know, it's... Uh, the seesaw between uh, Beijing and uh, and Moscow is very heavily weighed down by Beijing. Uh, you're not going to get a seesaw to move very far until, if you want, the, the Russian economy has grown enormously. At the moment, it's shrinking or growing. So, Rudiger, do you agree or disagree? Uh, of course, I partly agree. But I think the nice thing about Russia is that they give even less of a damn than the Chinese. I mean, they are now at war effectively with NATO. So what else do they have to lose? So they are much more willing, actually, to compromise with whatever demands the North Koreans have, whereas the Chinese still try to maintain at least the appearance of playing by the rules. That's one thing. The other thing is that the Russians have oil, right? Um, which the Chinese do not have, at least not in these quantities uh, that the North Koreans want. And the Russians have a lot of it and no one else is buying it. Well, that's not true, but uh, the traditional clients in, in Europe aren't buying it anymore. So it's just there. And I mean, it keeps you know flowing out of the earth or whatever. So these two things, I think, make Russia quite uh, interesting. Also in terms of transfers of military technology, which I understand is a major concern for the West. I think Russia is much more likely to be kind of receptive to North Korean requests in that regard, much more than uh, China, regardless of the actual potential. But uh, so I think uh, Russia does matter. Um, but of course, you're totally right. The economic jackpot, of course, is China. So Rachel, uh, let's visit for a moment uh, what appears to be a contradiction uh, in terms of efforts by the North Korean leadership to grow the economy or to make changes. Obviously, in the sense of ideology, North Korea leaders continue to talk about Juche, self-reliance, do it on our own, et cetera. Uh, the North Korean leader last year, uh, a number of times, uh, spoke out against contamination of North Korea by South Korean culture, et cetera, et cetera. 
But having said all that, uh, at the same time, the North Korean leadership has allowed ongoing training of North Koreans uh, on how to become entrepreneurs, how to make money. We There is uh, in Southeast Asia, an NGO that you're aware of that's actively involved in training North Koreans on how to make money, how to start a business. And the, this virtual training continues, it's my understanding. Um, over 3,000 North Koreans have now been trained on becoming an entrepreneur, making money. How does this um, coincide with the Juche, et cetera, et cetera? I think, so I think this, the economic reform, um, North Korea is trying to find a happy medium. It's trying to find that sweet spot uh, between what Kim Jong-un originally wanted, which was giving more freedom uh, to lower economic units um, and exerting greater self-control, I mean, a, a central control over the economy. So then you can ask the question of, well, if you're exerting greater central control, then is that really economic reform? I think in their minds, it is from, from North Korea's point of view. And I think they're trying to find that happy medium, that balance between what Kim Jong-un originally wanted and greater control. So continuing reform in a way that um, where the state has greater oversight. Uh, but going back to your uh, uh, question about Chuche um, self-reliance um, and um, economic reform, I there's a lot of it's a contradiction for sure because you do see a lot of ideological language, especially nowadays with the clampdown, you know, the greater tendency toward um, conservative policies. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot more. They, they continue to talk about you know, growing the economy, although there's not much language about reform um, these days. Um, so I think they have this feeling of obligation that they feel obligated to keep talking about um, Juche ideology, mm -hmm. self-reliance, because a lot of Kim Jong-un's legitimacy actually comes from these, from, from the ideology passed down, you know, to him by um, his forefathers. But um, I think a lot of it, um, to me, um, is is more rhetorical um, than anything because I think at the end of the day, they're they're um, they tend to be pragmatic. Um, Kim Jong Un, Rudiger, your thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, um, we all know this famous saying by the Deng Xiaoping about the cat, uh, whether it's black or white, as long as it catches mice, uh, it's a good cat. And uh, my understanding of North Korea's Juche ideology, whatever that is in detail is pretty much the same thing. I mean, they have this creative principle included and whatever the leader says is Juche is Juche. I mean, you know, if you if you ever try to pin that down to specifics, you realize how pretty general it actually is, leading some scholars to saying it's even completely devoid of any contents, which I think is a bit too much. But it's a very flexible ideology. And on a side note, um, what I do observe right now is a North Koreanization or Jucheization of the whole world. I mean, I don't know about the US, but definitely here in Europe, what we are doing looks a lot like North Korean ideology, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, autarky, bringing back core industries, even if it costs us more, getting control over supply chains, etc. I mean, it's a different terminology, but in principle, it's the same thing. So um, maybe North Korea even feels emboldened by these developments in the West. Uh, well, that was not completely serious, but uh, I think there's something to that as well. But uh, again, the uh, bottom line is translating Juche as 100% autarky has never been correct, and I don't think it's correct right now. I would strongly agree with Rachel. The North Koreans apply this in a very pragmatic way. Thank you. Glenn, um, given Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, that appears to have set off, um, on one hand, in, in Pyongyang, uh, becoming more emboldened, shall we say, in terms of Pyongyang's activities on a range of fronts. The Russia invasion of Ukraine had quite an effect uh, in the South, uh, not so much the invasion itself, but what uh, many in South Korea view as a tepid response by the U.S., uh, to that invasion, and that's led to talk about North Korea or South Korea developing nuclear weapons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
But um, I'd like for you, if you would, please, Glenn, to to delve into a little more this this idea that's out there of a strengthened North Korea, China, uh, Russia alliance. Um, from the West, it's easy to look at all this, to look at the statements of support to, about North, excuse me, statements of support from North Korea about Russia following the invasion of Ukraine, Putin's statements of support for North Korea, the, the China angle. From the West, uh, sometimes in our simplistic approach, not always understanding the uh, complexity of Northeast Asia history and relationships, we, we view this invasion and the response as a strengthening of that alliance. At the same time, Glenn, as you're aware, the North Koreans themselves from time to time have said uh, that they wouldn't mind U.S. troops staying in the peninsula, on the peninsula, as an offset to China. My point is that uh, it's, it's far more complex than what we often give the North Koreans credit for in terms of how they view the world, how they view Northeast Asia. It seems Kim Jong-un is, is a master at leveraging. Uh, he's a master at, at daily reviewing the situation and how he can take action or not to strengthen his own country's position. Uh, but talk to us about this. Talk to us, if you would, please, about how strong is this alliance uh, from your viewpoint? Uh, well, I mean, North Korea's got a, a pretty bad hand. Uh, they're rather good at playing it, and it's just got a little bit stronger. Uh, ideally, back if you look to 2017, uh, what the North Koreans wanted was to pivot towards Washington, 2017-18. Uh, uh, after Hanoi, without going into the, the, all the background, I mean, that, that was off the table. Uh, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has given them an opportunity to rebuild its relationship with Moscow. Uh, the point I made earlier, I think Rudig is entirely right. What have the Russians got to give? I mean, oil and the fact they're not China, um, uh, which is not insignificant, but nevertheless, they would actually like a rather stronger partner to, to, to balance between than Moscow and Beijing, where if you want the heavy, uh, the heavy lifting is all on one side of, uh, uh, of that relationship. So yes, that they're playing a, a bad hand fairly well. Uh, in terms of the economy, uh, the comment I'd make is in a sense reiterate what I said earlier. Uh, they're still encouraging reform, but within the state structures, I mean, every, uh, every department, every ministry, the international department, the party, they, they, they run enterprises. The, the Italian pizzeria in Pyongyang was run by the European Department of the Party many years ago. That's fine. What they don't like is what I call the independent uh, innovation, and that's where you're clamping down. But they don't have; they can't really go back all that all that far because they just don't have the resources to recreate the situation of the mid '90s. When, if you want, uh, outside of Pyongyang, I mean, apart from a few. Uh, very very limited pocket money. Everyone depended on the state for everything, education, health, and food. You you collected your rations, and that was it for the month. There's no way to go back to that. Uh, so the markets are going to be there for people to supply their basic needs over and above a very minimal delivery of uh, of central goods and services through the rationing department. All right. So now I'm going to turn to each of you for any closing final remarks, and, and also if there's a point that's not been discussed that you'd like to share, feel free to do so at this time. Rachel, I'll turn first to you. And by the way, Rachel, talk to us about the cell phone usage in North Korea uh, in, in terms of sharing of information, et cetera, along the way. Uh, cell phone usage is not something that I've been tracking closely uh, recently, but I there was a law that North Korea passed, I believe, um, a few months ago or late last year about clamping down on the outflow of information, uh, which I thought was interesting, but in line with what we have been seeing in terms of the um, conservative trend. So before um, it was the, it, they were clamping down on the inflow of information, um, but they also enacted then a law on outflow of information. And to me, that in that 
was targeting um, entities like Daily NK, for example, um, people using their cell phones to share information with outside entities. Um, that's what that law sounded like. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other comments, Rachel, in closing? Um, one comment that I would like to make is um, this idea of um, the Pyongyang, top, the top North Korean leaderships, um, possibly changing its views of the U.S. You know, in its overall um, strategic calculations. Um, is not something that um, has been well received uh, in Washington. <laughs> um, and I think it's because of the conventional wisdom that at the end of the day, North Korea needs the U.S. Um, for improving the economy um, and um, for regime security and for all of those things to happen. North Korea knows that it has to denuclearize. So I think that thinking is um, still very strong. Um, you know, when you talk to people about this idea of, you know, um, a possible fundamental shift in North Korea's foreign policy, um, especially with regard to the U.S. But I think um, it's worth maybe challenging that conventional wisdom um, based on what I'm seeing in, in, in state media, um, even though it may not be a popular notion. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Glenn, final comments? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I... Uh, we're at a very interesting uh, hinge point to, uh, to, to, to quote Sig, Sig Heckler. Uh, I mean, things are changing very rapidly and I'm not quite sure we know exactly where they're going. Uh, the one thing that we haven't really discussed that I'd throw in is if you want the prospect of South Korea going nuclear. Uh, it, it was always seen in some eyes as a bit of a threat to the North, but from my understanding, the threat would welcome the North Pyongyang would absolutely welcome uh, the, the South going nuclear. It would it would break the link with the United States. It would uh, it, it would threaten that alliance and the rest. So uh, the the idea that uh, is so uh, that, that Pyongyang is frightened by this prospect. No, it welcomes it and would applaud South Korea all the way. So, Glenn, uh, before I turn to Rudiger, I, I'd like for you to elaborate for a moment on prospects for engagement with between the United States and North Korea. As you're aware, uh, there is a history of US engagement with North Korea going back years. In the 1990s, uh, North Korean medical delegations came to the United States. North Koreans came to the United States to learn about agriculture development, uh, American NGO pre-COVID, we have 12 to 15 American NGOs involved in North Korea in the humanitarian context uh, across the board. Uh, we have a history of science engagement in the past between the United States and the North. Linda Staley, who's with us today, has prepared an outstanding documentary on the history of science engagement between the United States and North Korea. Uh, and then... There are the track two talks, which, as you know, have not existed following the failed Hanoi summit, just like track one has been dead. Uh, so, Glenn, what do you, from your perspective, I mean, you're talking to the North Koreans, you're interacting with them. So my question to you, putting you on the spot, what do you see as the prospects for renewed engagement between the United States and North Korea in any context? Oh, I, well, I mean, firstly, I think there's a prospect for engagement. As I said, the North Koreans have made approaches to the EU uh, about engagement, and it's the EU that's rejected them rather than the other way around. Uh, so in that sense, the North Koreans are willing to talk. I think the United States is a bit further away, uh, but I see absolutely the possibility comparatively uh, within the next 12 to 18 months, at least, if, uh, of a, a re-engagement there. The biggest problem, in a sense, I find is the US, you're making it increasingly difficult. The, the prospect of North Koreans coming to the US, it seems to me, will be more blocked in Washington than Pyongyang. Uh, and I have to say the US is not helping at all with European engagement. Uh, you know, I know people who have had to wait six months for a US visa. The kind of people who engage with North Korea uh, also are people who regularly travel to the United States. If going to North Korea means you've got to wait six months before you can travel to the US, is you have to get a visa under the current uh, under current 
uh, American legislation, it makes it very difficult for me to find people who are willing to go to North Korea to actually talk to them. So, Glenn, let me push back for a moment here. Um, uh, the United States, the Biden administration has repeatedly stated its willingness to meet North Koreans anytime, anywhere. And, and the Biden administration suggests the North Koreans aren't responding. How, how do you address that? Oh, I mean, I, I think they are responding to the U.S. I mean, the argument has been that North Korea doesn't want the North Koreans don't want to talk to any anybody. That's not true. They certainly don't want to talk to the United States at the moment. They're extremely badly bruised. Uh, they don't like uh, the reaction. Uh, if you want the reformulation of Singapore that was made by uh, by the Biden administration. For them, denuclearization of the peninsula was code. They could have a civil nuclear program. But the Biden administration uh, rather ambiguously sometimes talks about denuclearizing the peninsula and other times talks about denuclearizing North Korea. Now, for the North Koreans, that's a we You can't have a civil nuclear program. Now, uh, those shifts are important. And uh, when, they, uh, when, they, when they see American officials with the abductee badges on, uh, as they saw Tony Blinken after his visit to Tokyo 12 months ago. It, all of those signals are very important for the North Koreans. And that at the moment, all of those signals coming out to the US are negative, despite we'll talk anytime, anywhere. What are the signals they're getting? It, it's not going to be very, very productive talks. You know, we could continue this line of discussion for quite a while, but we won't, given the sake of time. Rudiger, we turn to you for final remarks. Yeah, thank you. Well, the one thing that um, I keep wondering about is the long-term effects of what has actually been achieved in the last two or three decades. Um, I mean, obviously, COVID was a wonderful opportunity to shut the country down. Uh, war in Ukraine is a great excuse for not opening it up again towards the West as it used to be. Uh, that's all crystal clear. But based on my own experience um, in Eastern Europe, in East Germany, I do know that some things they just, I mean, they won't go away just because they don't produce any immediate results. They are in there. It's like a like a virus that you have in your blood. And, you know, it might be sleeping for a while, but it's still working. So what I'm talking about is, of course, the new opportunities that a larger number of North Koreans, call them the new middle class, had experienced in the past, you know, for their individual advancement and for social mobility, etc. And even if the state is trying to kind of uh, put that all back to square one, uh, in the minds of people, it's still there. And I really wonder what the long term effects are, whether the government in North Korea is aware of that, and whether they find kind of a substitute went for all this energy to be directed for example a more kind of a politically correct uh, economic activity that is still private but not as much uh, probably private marketized westernized as uh, we would want it to be but still i think this is a factor and um, it's one of these developments that i'm watching so rudiger uh, earlier in this program you and and others referenced the fact that uh, china in major ways is supporting North Korea and Russia, whether it be food assistance, economic, other types of economic assistance, et cetera. Um, Kim Jong-un, when he became leader, moved from a military first policy to an economy first, changing, developing the economy seems to be a passion of his, a major focus of his for a variety of reasons. Uh, given the fact that Hanoi was a failure, given the fact that there has been no sanctions relief for the North. Um, are you of the opinion that the North Koreans have basically decided now to, to go it alone, to forge ahead, and, and to, to sort of forget about uh, prospects of engaging with, with the West, with other parts of the world, which could lead to eventual sanctions relief, relief, which would lead to the ability to connect with the international financial institutions and so on? Have they given up on all that? I'm pretty sure that they have uh, given up on trying to get sanctions relief. And uh, as we know, uh, China and Russia are building an alternative payment system, an alternative to SWIFT. Uh, probably also, you know, the renminbi will become more relevant. So that's not a concern. But what the North Koreans have not given up, and they cannot give it up ob objectively, is their competition with South Korea, where they are really far behind in terms of economic development.
and I think they fully understand that this will that this reduces their attractiveness. And uh, we tend to be very much self-centered, but the main North Korean goal was and is and will be Korean unification one way or the other. So that competition with South Korea. So I do think that they are still interested in having economic development in the Western sense. That is uh, more products, more consumer products, a greater variety, more welfare, more prosperity, better infrastructure and whatnot. And uh, they will just explore new opportunities to, to reach that goal. Uh, it will not necessarily be getting rid of sanctions so that they finally you know, can enter the promised land. Uh, they now have other options, but the goal remains the same. And this is where I also see some potential. Well, thanks to each of you for your outstanding contributions to today's program. It's really uh, been, been wonderful. I'd like to also thank my colleagues, uh, Marissa McPherson and Seth Joyner and the NCNK membership and, our, and, and the donors uh, to NCNK. So have a nice day. Have a nice evening. Thanks for staying with us. And, and again, thank you so much. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.